Hey guys, my name is Nick. I'm a Microsoft Certified Expert Administrator. Create a lot of content for MSPs, and this is part two of five part series I'm creating here to map the M365 business solution to the NIST cybersecurity framework. This section today is going to be about the protect core function. If you haven't already, go back to part one if you haven't seen that and view the identify core function and how that solution maps in addition to learning an intro about NIST cybersecurity framework, things of that nature. So with the framework that we're going through here, again, on a high level, we're going through each of the core functions in the NIST categories here, as far as the core function categories and subcategories. And I'm mapping the M365 business solution, giving you some action items that you can take and providing some questions that you can ask both yourself and the customer to understand how you can be in alignment with the NIST framework. So with Protect here, uh, this is to direct quote from the NIST framework itself as far as the description. And we're saying develop and implement appropriate safeguards to ensure delivery of critical services. The first category we have here is the identity management and access control. So access to assets and associated facilities is limited to authorized users, processes, and devices, and to authorized activities and transactions. So with this, I feel like you'd want to ask a lot of questions around how users are accessing data, where they're accessing data, and what applications they use across the organization that contain corporate data as well too. Most of these questions will make the customer understand where they're exposed from a security and compliance standpoint. In a lot of cases, that's going to come from them accessing the data on personally managed devices like their personal cell phone, and they're accessing that data in a very insecure manner and there's no way for you to remove that data once the employee leaves or that device is lost or stolen. So these are some of the questions to bring awareness around that but also understand if they have access, what kind of access they have from a standpoint of their rights. And that's also important to assess too because while we're going through this we do want to apply a model of least privilege across the organization. So with the M365 solution, you have Azure AD, Intune, and conditional access. So with conditional access, you have uh, certain conditions that are met, such as the user being on a trusted location or the user being on an unmanaged device, things of that nature, to enforce certain controls. So you could grant access but require heightened security, such as multi-factor authentication or something like that. So with users and groups, you could scope this out to individual users, individual groups, and say maybe you want to exclude a certain user from that group to apply to a certain policy. You can do that. With applications, you want to say, okay, which ones have the most critical business data? What kind of access do I want to give them if they're not on my network? What kind of access do I want them to have if they're on an unmanaged device like their cell phone? And that's where you look at the apps that have the most sensitive data. Devices there, you want to look and say, okay, what do I want to do if you're not on a device enrolled in my MDM solution? What kind of level of access do I want to give for these certain applications, for all applications? So you really want to scope that out and ask these questions. And then locations is the last one. So we move off of this model of, hey, you're on my trusted network with a firewall, you can have access. Because now with the mentality people have of wanting to work anywhere at any time, on any device, they're gonna say that you're inhibiting their productivity by not granting them access. So you want to say you can access this data off network, but I'm gonna require some heightened security from you, like MFA, or preventing the ability to download that to the local device or something like that. So these are all the uh, conditions that can be met, and then you apply controls. So this is a good diagram straight from Microsoft that is showing you basically what I've been talking about this whole time. So conditions are met and then we can apply controls. So these can be saying it's unimpeded access. You can go ahead and get on without having to do anything else. So that could be somewhere, something where you're on your own network and the user is on a trusted device. It's on a managed device that's in a healthy state and you just get a grant access without any additional controls. But then the other scenarios are when you get into heightened security, which is requiring MFA, forcing a password reset, and the sense of applications, forcing them to accept terms of use. So you can really get as granular as you want here in providing that access. But I think when you 
are looking to implement this solution, you should look at it at, at an application level where you want to define a risk score for each application and then apply these controls across based off of the criticality of that app itself. So in a business case here, if you're thinking of a clear customer example, you have a customer that has this financial document with pertinent sensitive business data in there. There's intellectual property, there's critical numbers that they use for quarterly reports. It's something that if it got lost or stolen or it was put in the hands of, of somebody else, they would be critical and crippling to the business in, in a sense. So what you want to do is apply more restrictive policies around this. So you could set up a conditional access policy to allow them to access the document in a browser, require MFA, and then prevent download if they're not on a trusted device. So if they're off network, if they're accessing it from their personal laptop and they still want to access the document, you're not inhibiting their productivity because you're allowing them to access that in the browser. They can use Excel online, for instance, something like that. But you are putting these controls into place to help prevent with data loss, which is having the data corrupted on the device or requiring additional MFA or something of that nature as well, too. So some of the action items I would take here for this particular category, you definitely, again, want to take an asset inventory and assign a risk score to those assets. So how critical is it to the business? What kind of data does it contain? Who has access to it? What are those users' rights in the sense of permissions? And define a risk score. So that could be one to five. Uh, that could be something that you internally define based off of other policies you've already set up that makes sense. But gathering that inventory and having a process for how people onboard and offboard applications is really the foundation to this and gives you the groundwork for creating these policies. You want to create the policies in at least the most restrictive model where you implement them out to pilot group of users as well too. So you're saying that if I do create this policy, I want to understand the impacts. And within the portal, I wanted to show you here, you do have this cool little what if scenario that you can click on and you can define certain settings that you would be applying and understand the impacts if users are signing on under certain conditions. So you're saying if it's going to block or prevent their access or grant them access based off that and the policies that you've set up. So that's one good way to evaluate it. But also there may be just information that hasn't been shared with you that the customer that they, they access data all the time in a certain manner that they didn't tell you about. And all of a sudden you turn on this policy that blocks their access. You don't want that. So definitely pilot it out and make sure that everybody has understanding of what this looks like because the biggest thing you want is compliance and adoption so definitely do a phase rollout with these policies one of the big things though over 82 percent of security breaches happen because mfa is not in place so i would say at a very baseline level you do want to start enforcing multi-factor if users are off your network and make sure that's a that's a hard requirement so if there's any one policy you would create is saying that you have to have MFA to access these resources off network. So the categories, subcategories that are met here are listed below, but I'll do that for each one of these certain functions and, and categories if they do apply. So the next one we have here is awareness and training. Their organizations, personnel, and partners are provided cybersecurity awareness, education, and are adequately trained to perform their information security related duties and responsibilities consistent with related policies, procedures, and agreements. So with this one, the two biggest questions are, one, do we even provide cybersecurity awareness training? What does that look like today? How, how periodic is that for the end users? And secondly, do they understand the importance of it? So people with higher privilege rights or higher up in the organization, do they understand they're more likely to get attacked uh, in a phishing incident, spear phishing, something like that? And how do users report to you as far as when they detect certain incidents? Do you have that defined? Is it easy for them to do so, um, to open up a case with you that says, hey, I think this is a phishing email? And it may be a false positive, but you'd rather have them do that than to fall under uh, an attack. So with the M365 business solution, the ATP, Advanced Threat Protection, comes with an attack simulator uh, but the attack simulator is not available with M365 business. It is with the enterprise plans. 
I'm not going to dive into that, and this may be something where you want to bolt on uh, awareness and protection tool like Breach Secure Now or Know Before or something like that that does the end user training as well. So the next category we have is data security. Information and records data are managed consistent with the organization's risk strategy to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. So with this one, there's tons of controls in the M365 business solution that relate directly to data loss. But you really want to understand, and again, make the customer understand where they're exposed from the data loss standpoint. So you want to understand where they're accessing that data, what applications have sensitive data, how they're accessing it. If it's in an unsecure manner, we need to address that. And we need to create some policies that make sure that we are being protected, even the event of human error or something like that. Because most people aren't considering the fact that they're free to save those documents to personal locations or cut copy paste into personal locations, things of that nature as well. So with the 365 solution, again, myriad of different options here as far as uh, being able to apply at a user level, device level, and application level. So with Azure Information Protection, you can really classify certain data types and you can provide certain controls around that. You'll find a pretty consistent theme across the stack here is that it has capabilities to detect certain sensitive data like PII, social security numbers, and automatically use tags to apply a tag to that document to apply your controls. So it's saying I'm going to create an Azure Information Protection label that would detect for certain PII. And if it detects that PII, I want to label it with a label that's called confidential, for instance. And with confidential, I want to put in policies that say I want to retain this for seven years and I don't want users to send this to external domains, something of that nature. So it gets pretty granular again, but it does provide that protection and it avoids human error from people not remembering to label a document or not knowing that it contains that data as well. With BitLocker, you have BitLocker encryption on Windows 10 devices. This is something you can set up an Intune policy to automatically configure on enrolled devices. But encryption is in REST and in transit with all Microsoft Cloud services, so just know that. With app protection policies, you can push this out to Windows, iOS, and Android devices where you're saying these are managed applications that you can use to access corporate data. If it's on an unmanaged application, like they're trying to access their native mail client for the work email, you can prevent them from doing so with a message that will redirect them to the Outlook app in the Google Play Store or Windows or the iTunes Store, I should say. And they'll then have to download that and access corporate data that way. And it'll pop up with a message that says this device is being managed by your IT department. So they understand that, you know, that data is there. And the cool part about mobile application management with Intune is the fact that it will encrypt that data on the corporate device and separate it out from personal data. So if that device is lost or stolen or the employee leaves, you can automatically go ahead and remotely wipe that data as well. Data loss prevention policies are additionally there as well too. So again, you can detect certain PII in email, in SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, and you can apply certain policies around it. So you could say, I want to encrypt this if it's being sent. I want to uh, prevent external use. I want to just give policy tips that says, hey, do you understand this contains credit card information, for instance? And it brings awareness around best security practices to the end user, but ultimately prevents them from doing certain things if you want to apply those controls. So this is a label from Azure Information Protection. And it's a wizard that you go through and set up, but this is where you could define those conditions, such as detecting certain information types and providing policy tips that you clearly define there that is custom to how you want to do that. This is a device profile that you can create for the devices you enroll into Intune. And with this, you can define BitLocker encryption as being a requirement and set it so that it automatically configures. And here, this is an example of a user going to their personal uh, Gmail and trying to attach a corporate document in an email. And they'll get this message that says, your organization doesn't allow you to work here. Same thing if they try to cut copy paste, I'll get the same exact message. 
Lastly here, this is an Android device, but I was mentioning earlier, they're trying to access their mail on the native client. It redirects them to the Google Play Store to download Outlook. And then you can separate that corporate and personal data on the device level without actually having to have it enrolled in the MDM solution. So this is a clear business case again. You want to make sure that you have all of the documents in a managed application as far as where they're being stored and saved. Most likely that's going to be something like OneDrive where they save all their personal documents. You can use the known folder move to sync all of their folders on that device to OneDrive and say that it's corporate uh, data. And for these documents, you want to protect the ones that have certain credit card information. So this is again where we can apply an Azure Information Protection Label or a Data Loss Prevention Policy to detect the certain sensitive information. And we can set up those ad protection policies that prevent them from saving this into unmanaged locations or personal locations. So you can set all these policies up so that this information is protected and it is from a data loss standpoint being protected if they try to send it into an extra domain. So for action items here, you definitely understand what types you're going to support as far as managed devices. And again here, Windows, Mac iOS, and Android are the device platform types that the Intune MDM solution supports. So once you define that, you want to create a compliance policy for each one of those particular platforms that defines what makes it healthy. Right? Is that BitLocker encryption? Is that BitLocker plus an antivirus present? You can really get granular about what that looks like. So if it ever gets to an unhealthy state, that's where you can piggyback into the conditional access policies again and say if it's not compliant, then I don't want to allow access because maybe there's malware on the device now or something of that nature, so you can really get restrictive. You want to roll those devices into the MDM solution then, and you also want to create the app protection policies and AIP labels from a data loss standpoint as well too. So the next category that we have here is protective technology. Technical security solutions are managed to ensure the security and resilience of the systems and assets consistent with related policies, procedures, and agreements. So when you think again of this protective technology, I think a lot more so around the data loss prevention capabilities that uh, Microsoft has within the solution and bringing awareness to how exposed this data is when it's off your network. So with the M365 solution, again, we're looking at Intune, conditional access data loss prevention policies, Azure information protection, and then also advanced threat protection, which we'll get into here. So at a device level, you're looking at the mobile device management capabilities. You're looking at preventing data loss to the applications if they're not managed. You're granting access to certain devices if they're enrolled in that solution, maybe preventing them if they're not. At the user level, we can say if you're on my network, then you can get access to these with unimpeded rights. And then if you're not, there might be some other controls that you put into place. And at the application level, we're saying if this app is a critical you know, business risk, then I want to put some more controls around that as far as who can access it off the network, what kind of rights do they have, prompt for MFA, prevent download. So you really can scope this down these high level categories and get granular with your policies that you define to protect this information and protect the data that the company has. So with advanced threat protection, this is again, protective technology in the sense that it's looking for safe links and safe attachments. So when a user sends you, uh, an external user potentially or an internal, sends you an email with a link in it, it's going to automatically, when you click on that link, it's in real time, it does real time detonation into a sandbox environment to look for malicious content and it'll tell the user that this is not protected. Um, and this is the message that they would see here. So they get a phishing email, they try to click on the link, it scans it, and blocks their access completely. So the same thing you can do with the safe attachments. So if somebody sends you a document or a PDF or something like that, it's gonna do that real-time scanning. Again, at the time that the email was sent, you can configure the settings for dynamic delivery, which I think is pretty cool, where the user actually gets the body of the email and with a little message that says, this email is being scanned for malicious content, the attachment is, we'll reattach it as soon as we're done. 
generally around 30 to 45 seconds that takes, so not too long. But at least there's some messaging around that that's being done for the end user. And it'll reattach once it's done scanning and it, and it sees that it's not anything malicious. The cool part about safe attachments as well too is it expands outside of Exchange into SharePoint, OneDrive, and Teams as well. So if you have a malicious document that somehow got through your network and lives within the company, it'll detect that if they try to share it across Teams or if they go to SharePoint and OneDrive environments as well too. This is again a cool feature that it gives as far as some updates to the end user, some recommendations, if it detects certain anomalies. So it's saying, hey, this is um, an email that you don't often get from this person. Uh, so be cautious of this email. So that's great. So they have some awareness before they go and click on links or attachments as well. So in this business case, you have a user's device that's infected with malware. They don't know that there's malware on the device and they're trying to access that corporate data. If you've set up a conditional access policy that says, if this device is in an unhealthy state, I want to prevent access to corporate data, Intune will go into a non-compliant state and they will prevent access to that end user. And this is the message that they'll see there. So it's saying your device is, is not healthy and they can open up a ticket. This is good because one, it's immediately locking down the environment to spreading this and having the attacker move laterally throughout the environment. And additionally, you're not under so much pressure and constraints of trying to go fix this device because you know that they're not able to access any corporate data. So you have a little bit more time to figure out how to resolve the incident. So some action items here. You want to, again, same as the last one, understand the devices you're going to support create your policies around that, create your labels for labeling documents. Here we also want to set up the ATP safe links policy, safe attachments policy, and policies around anti-phishing. So if you find that you have some high level users within the organization like the CEO or people who would most likely be more susceptible to get attacked from a spear phishing incident, you can scope certain granular policies around them in particular, just for some heightened protection. So the next category that we have here is information protection and processes and procedures. So security policies that address purpose, scope, roles, responsibilities, management, commitment, and coordination among organizational entities. Processes and procedures are maintained and used to manage protection of information systems and assets. So when I think about this, I think about the policies around retention and backup jobs that are being done. So you, first and foremost, if you don't already, you definitely need to have a SaaS backup solution in place. And this could be a bunch of third-party providers. Microsoft doesn't have a direct solution for this, but you need something that's backing up the email on a periodic basis. So there's companies out there that you can uh, bolt on for like $2 a user extra a month but you need to have those things in place. You need to be backing up the data multiple times per day from an email standpoint, especially for compliance firms. Overall here, you really want to define what your policies are internally as well around retention. So in some cases, they may have to meet those compliance regulations and that's more strict, but in other cases, you're going to need to help them define that. And I think a great place to start is with their HR department because you can define what they look at as far as employee records and retention of those records and closely align with them to define this policy as far as what retention looks like. So you need to define where data is being stored, how long are you storing it, is there a policy for archiving, what does that look like, and have all these things in place, especially as the company grows. It's going to get harder and harder to put these things in place as the company is growing into a larger organization. So you need to define what that looks like, how long information is retained after an employee leaves. Within M365, you have an unlimited archiving solution. So 50 gig mailbox is available with M365 Business, but you can turn on unlimited archiving. By default, it's going to have a two-year retention, as far as two-year archiving, I should say, from the standpoint of it's two years old, we will automatically move it into the archive. So you can change that if you want. You can set up custom retention policies across the users or particular information. And that's where, again, we see those labels that we can apply for certain sensitive information. 
with custom retention policies behind them. We keep them for seven years and then they're automatically deleted, something like that. Litigation hold is something else that you can set up within there and do basic e-discovery. So you can set a case up for a particular user and track all their interactions for a specified amount of time and then review that and from the e-discovery standpoint, do heightened level audits on that information as well. So standard operating procedure, SOP, you want to incorporate these policies into that when you onboard a customer or you acquire a customer so that you have these things defined and they're closely aligned with the company as far as how long you retain that data. In some legal cases, it's better it will put you in more liable scenario when you retain that information for a longer period of time when you should have just deleted it. So you have to understand when a good time to do that is without the customer getting upset about that or something that you have to reach back out to, but making sure there's a, a definite process in place for when it's being archived, how long you're retaining it, when it's being purged, when it's being reviewed for an audit perspective, things of that nature. And from the backup standpoint, define your recovery point objectives or time objectives to getting them back online and communicating with them what that looks like so you can deliver clear expectations. So if there is an event where they delete their mail, they understand you know, what time frame you can get them back up and running again. So this is, again, a label that we can configure here. And this is saying we can define the retention period. We can choose what actions to take we can say that it's detecting sensitive information to do this. So you can really get granular with this, but you can, like it's saying here, trigger disposition review, do nothing, or retain the content, just delete it if it's older than X amount of time. So you can create some automation around this where you're not constantly having to review all the documents all the time. The big thing with 365 that many people are aware of now is that by default the retention is set to 30 days after you delete a mailbox item to officially just purge that um, out of the system so this has caused a lot of complications so either one you can go and customize the default retention policy to a more uh, higher level time frame like 90 days for instance but in most cases i would highly recommend to get a third-party SaaS backup solution just so that you have these periodic backups going on and you're backing up more than just the exchange environment. You can back up OneDrive, you can back up Teams. Teams chats is gonna be a big thing as well too in the future. So action items here, definitely make sure you have this uh, SaaS provider, define what your retention policies look like for emails, documents, chat, define what it looks like for the backups after an employee leaves set up those custom retention policies based off the business needs and aligning with their HR department to do so and aligning with compliance regulations if it is applicable. So the last category we have here is maintenance. Maintenance and repairs of industrial control and information system components are performed consistent with policies and procedures. So this is really related the two categories or subcategories that are applicable here all pertain to the assets, quote unquote assets that you manage for the customer. So when I think about that, I think about the devices we have under management. I think about the applications that we're managing for them. I think about the on-prem infrastructure that we manage from an Active Directory standpoint, if you're using the hybrid join to Office 365. So you probably already have certain ticketing system in place, but how well are your policies defined for your procedures around that? What, do you, what does it look like for the customer from beginning to end when they open up a ticket with you? How do you track the maintenance or repairs of their devices? And the big piece around that is that if there's vulnerabilities when you do that. Are you remoting in? How are you authenticating? How are you accessing their data, their assets when you do so? Because in a lot of cases, there's vulnerabilities that come about just from you performing these maintenance activities and you're falling out of compliance based off the way you're doing that in certain regulations or the way that you communicate that with the customer or track that as well too. So you want to make sure that's clearly defined. And even things like Intune, for instance, you want to track and ticket when a device goes out of compliance and what you did to bring it back into a healthy state. So if you get audited, you can show all this. You have a definite process that you can communicate with the end user. It gets better over time. 
and all of your texts can track this as well too. So it's easier for them to remediate an issue as well. Hybrid considerations, same thing if you're going remoting into the DC and performing some functions there for maintenance, make sure you're doing it in a secure manner. These are the two subcategories, the PRMA one and two there that are part of this uh, category itself. And again, they just pertain to the assets that you manage. So we really wanna focus on the ticketing system that we're using and the processes and procedures around that. This is a device that's gone out of compliance here. And you have all the tracking that has timestamps of when this happened and you know what is going on and that's making it uncompliant. But this isn't directly tied with your ticketing system. So you want to have a process procedure when these things happen. Maybe it's an alert that creates a ticket that you can set up in here. Maybe it's something where you just have a, a defined process that you're texting of when this happens, but definitely track this and make sure you review your processes around when you're remoting into devices. How is that communicated to the customer? Do they know how you're accessing their data? Is it documented and everything like that? So you, you're making sure you're keeping up checks and balances around how you're performing those actions. So that's everything I had for you guys in this video series for part two. Next part three is going to be around the detect core function. If you guys have any questions or comments around what we covered in this one around protect, feel free to leave them below. Thanks. Have a good one.